All right, good afternoon. Um, so let's get started. Um, are there any questions about what we covered so far? We're still in the process of like understanding what what colors are and what you know the the things necessary for us to understand um, how it affects you know, computing, right? Um, so. So in the last class, we were looking at color spaces, you know, the different color transformations, and essentially doing the color transformation um, does not change the way the, the, the image looks, but it allows us to use some of the, our notions of you know, what human eye can see so we can draw some of the parameters, right? So we take a RGB image, which, which is how you project it on this screen, because if you look in there, it has a red, green, and blue component, which adds to create the different colors, right? But if you can convert it into the Y C, you know, Y C B C R, where um, then you can you can keep more of the the brightness component and less of the color components, so you you it looks acceptable to you, and that's the notion, right? So over the next couple of lectures, uh, first we start off by looking at images and how images are stored, and then we look at how a uh, little bit about audio and a little bit about video. Um, and how we use this notion of what we can hear, what we can see to, to get good advantage, right? The reason why we're doing this is uh, you'll realize that uh, image, right, it's a, if you think of them as an array of, of, of integer values, it's a uniform uh, size. I mean, an integer of uh, array of size like 1,000 by 1,000 would have a certain amount of size, but all these operations that we do make that some parts of the uh, of the array becomes smaller than the other part, right? So we can throw some information out. So that means that when you're sending a video, it's not sent as 30 frames per second as 30 frames of equal size. Some frames are larger than other ones, and same same for audio and stuff. And that causes um, the the system to work in some sense. It also places some more pressure because some frames are larger than the other ones, so it's not a uniform uh, uniform notion of a transmission. And that's what it, we're trying to understand, right? So we, we, are, we, we started looking at bitmap, and then we, we, we saw the notion of a grayscale. And throughout all this stuff, you can look at them as color and all those things, like the way we, we see. But essentially, they are integers. As far as the system is concerned, they're a bunch of integers. So when you think of bitmaps, you have, a, let's say, an image of 1,000 by 1,000. It's a 1,000 by 1,000 uh, uh, bit fields. So if you think about an 8-bit eight uh, grayscale, it's, it's a, 1,000 by 1,000 matrix, each of 8 by 8 bits uh, deep. And if, if you show them as a, on a black and white scale, it looks like a gray scale, right? And we look at the other forms of, uh, of, of the, uh, showing images. The next, next image format is a color image, right? You can still have a, so in terms of color, um, you can have a one-bit color, which is basically a bitmap, and it's not really color, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's black and white. So you can think of an 8-bit color, right? Um, and the, the standard is usually 8-bit and 24-bit. 24-bit is called a true color. 24-bit uh, uh, corresponds to 8 bits for red, 8 bits for green, 8 bits for blue. And when you talk about 8-bit color, um, you have 8 bits for the, for the entire color gamut, which 8-bit translates to 256 colors. So this means that you have 256 colors to describe every pixel of the image, right? Uh, so if you think about it, if you think about it in the in the context of a 24-bit color, 24-bit color would be, um, I think, 16 million, right? So you can have 16 million different variants of colors that you can you can potentially see or potentially show on the monitor. Remember the color map and the triangle that you have. Making it go to 256 would mean that you have an awfully lot less colors, right? So you're translating from something which is 16 million all the way to um, 256, right? And so in some sense, if you don't, if you directly translate everything, right? If you if you basically say, I just take the 24-bit number and then basically make it into a 8-bit field, then you get awful color because the. Uh, so what that means is, let's say the color value is uh, up to 16 million, right? If you just divide them by by constant, right, to get 256. You would you're practically assigning, let's say, red to one color, and the next color variant might be orange or something. So you don't have the shading kind of effects. Right? So one way to avoid that is through using a notion of a color lookup table, 
So what you do is, rather than doing this kind of a transformation to get your 256 bit, you create a table right, of 256 values. And for each entry, you have a 24-bit value. right? So you, you take a full screen image. You find out the histogram of all the colors. That's one way to do this. Look, look at all the colors. And then look at the top, so let's say, 256 colors. And then find out what those colors are. Do this mapping, right? So you do you do a color lookup table, and essentially that way you can transform your image to another image, right? Or you can do it through a number of ways, but essentially the idea here is you choose a set of two to six important colors, and find out what the mapping is for a 24-bit uh, color using a color map, and then use that to show the show the image, right? So I can you know, show an example of how this would look. So essentially, this is a real color, 256 uh, real color <coughs> image, right? So if you use a color map, right, you can you can make it such that you choose the 256 best colors for your particular image. So if an image happens to use all the colors in a spectrum, then this is not going to be a good transformation. But if it uses only a few of them, then it will look fine, right? So if you look at this image, right, where do you see which part of the image do you see um, things being off, and which part do you not notice any difference? If I didn't tell you anything, if I just say, ask you to compare that and this image, right? Yeah. Sky. Yeah, the sky becomes what, what Adam was pointing out to be blocky, right? So what really, yeah, so the sky, it shows certain colors, right? If you look in the in, in the on the sky over here, which you can't really see on this particular monitor because it's not really um, it's it's not a good good projector, right? But essentially, it has a wide range of blue values, right, from on the on the sky, because it, it gets deeper as it moves up, right? So when you look at it from the on this monitor, it looks like it's all uniformly blue, but it, it tends to be like that. So they couldn't allocate all the blue to the to the particular stuff. So they basically said. So let's assume if you if you had it as a shade, right? So let's assume it went like one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, and so on, right? This is like a smooth. If you look at this as a color, it'll be sort of like a smooth variation. So they decided that what they're going to do is these three would be mapped to say color one, and these would be mapped to say color six, which is essentially what the color map table lookup table would do, right? So what what happens now is now you see the color go from one to six, right? So all this area would now be using one, and all this would be using color six. So you notice th th those kind of stuff very quickly. So what looks like a gra gra gradual gradation, gra gradation now looks blocky because now you're choosing different colors for the different uh, aspects of it. And it looks, it looks annoying. Uh, so depending on how good the algorithm is in, in terms of you doing this stuff, it may or may not be annoying to you, right? So if you're interested in looking at this, uh, at this, the, this building, it looks fairly good. So even though this one has 16 million colors and this one only has 256 colors, it still looks okay, right? So that's, that's one of the reasons why when you, depending on the algorithm, depending on your software, you, the transformation can make the image look awful or look good, right? This was a this was a technique that was that also had implications for displays, right? So one of the things that he mentioned that if you have an eight-bit screen, you notice the stuff. So if you if you move your screen, so I was looking trying to see if this card would support anything like eight-bit uh, color, but unfortunately or fortunately, the the projector only supports thirty-bit colors, right? So I can't really show this on the screen. But what really happens is when you when you're projecting this on a system, let's say this is your Windows screen, and let's say you have a bunch of displays, right? Let's, this, this is a Word, let's say this is a PowerPoint, and say this is a GIF image, right? You have multiple windows on your screen, right? So if your card only supported eight bits, right, it can, it can use a single color table for all this stuff, right? It can use a single color table for all this stuff so that you will get the same color for all these things, or you can choose a color table per application, right? If you use X windows or something like that, uh, at some, uh, and, and you will notice this stuff. What this means is, 
you, you, you may choose the best 2 of 6 representation for this particular image, which may not matter mean anything for here, right? So if you use per application color map, then when you're looking at the screen, when you're looking at this, um, this GIF image, all of them would be, you cannot read them, right? Because the colors would be so far off that they would look completely off, right? If you use one for the whole display, then everything can be readable all at once, except everything would be really poor because this may really need lots of colors, this may need fewer colors, and so on and so forth. Um, so depending on the, on the graphics card, you don't notice this stuff, right? Most of the modern systems that you buy, even the, the, the super cheap computers these days, can support true color, so you don't notice this stuff. But if you look at a slightly older version of, of, of systems, you would have noticed some of the, the, the artifacts of this, right? And, and you, you kind of pointed out um, how it happens, right? So this is, this is one way of how you can represent 8 bits. You can use 8 bits to display color. And the reason here is you don't want to go to the higher resolution as much as possible because A, it puts stress on your graphics card because it has to show all, all this much. So your display may not support it, your card may not support it. And B, if you go to a true 24-bit you know, color, you hope, you're, you're expecting it to have three times as much data, right? So 8-bit color, go from 8-bit to 24-bit, means that you have three times as much data, which means the image may be bigger, right? So that's, that's the expectation. And as you'll see, that, that assumption need not hold true, especially with the, some other compression that we're going, to, we're going to see. So in terms of the raw amount of data, a bitmap would have one-eighth of the data as a 256-bit, 256-color uh, or 8-bit image, uh, and 24-bit would be three times as much data. But when you use the compression techniques, it's not really all that, uh, it, it need not uh, be all that bad, right? So again, yeah, again going back to the thing, so 24-bit uh, is considered true color. For all practical purposes, 24-bit is considered to uh, represent all that, all that systems can deal with. So most of the cameras and most of the monitors that you, you, you get do not go past 24-bit, uh, right? Um, there are some high-end cameras which can take pictures in 48 bits, um, and those tend to be on the $10,000 plus range just for the body kind of stuff, for the, but for the most common use, 256 considered to be the true color. In fact, JPEG supports 256, uh, uh, sorry, 24-bit as the maximum uh, image size. Um, so again, if you, if you think of them naively, if you take 640 by 480 and you take 24 bits and raw uncompressed image, you're going to take 921 kilobytes, which is, which is considered fairly big because this is a very, fairly small image and it, it, it yeah, grows linearly, right? In, in practice, they may not store 24-bit as 24-bit. You may store it as 32-bit because when you, do, you know, when you think of modern computers, they operate on 32-bit integers, so it makes processing easier, right? So if you're operating on this using a um, PowerPoint or Photoshop or something, 24-bit would make your you know, um, data alignment and everything kind of complicated. So if you think of the architecture world, right? They like to, so if you have modern machines are either 32-bit or 64-bit, so keeping a 24-bit value messes up stuff in terms of computation and stuff. And you can also use this other eight bits for alpha values, right? Alpha values are, are basically, if you want to add some kind of a closed caption on top of image, right? So if you want to add uh, closed captioning on top of image, one way to do that is to put them in a separate channel by itself called the alpha channel. So what happens is you have two images, so use the 32-bit, which is four integers, as red, green, and blue, and this is alpha. And I can use that to overlay something on top of this image. So I can, I can add another image on top of this image. And the nice thing is, I can then remove it easily, right? So if you're watching a DVD movie and I want to show closed captioning, and I want to remove closed captioning, all I have to do is choose whether to show this particular channel, right? So that's, that's, that's another technique that people use to show overlap two or three different concepts, and you can nicely fit, it, fit that into this model because then you can add this advertisements or whatever as the alpha channel and choose to show it or not show it. It's always there on the, on the, on the system. It makes our processing easier because we process the first three bits for the most part, but also add, helps us add. So rather than just wasting it, we can use other stuff with it, right? But, in, in, so, but you only use the 24 bits for storing images. Um, so 
let's now let's look at some of the popular image uh, storage storage formats that uh, you would have used. The first one, the most popular one, uh, at least for a, for a while, is is GIF, right? GIF is a so the first word you will hear, which is one thing that we will uh, look a little bit more after we go to the introduction about uh, video and audio and all, is the notion of lossy and lossless compression, right? Compression algorithm is something that you probably learned in your algorithms class, right? Essentially, compression is, is a hashing function where you have some data, you apply some hashing function, and you get another object, right? Hopefully, the other object is smaller. And the, the nice thing is when you reverse the process, you get the old data back exactly the way it was, right? So when you compress your um, your projects using zip or something, you expect your file to go from one to, you know, once you do the compression, to go to the other form. And you expect it to be to be smaller for the most part, right? But it cannot be smaller for all the all the sizes. But it's, you expect your uh, whatever you stored to be reversible, right? So whatever you stored, you want it to be exactly the same thing. And as you will see that if you if you're willing to relax that, if you're willing to relax it such that if I compress something, I lose something which I can never get back, right? Which is considered to be lossy. Then I can actually do a uh, lot of interesting stuff, and that's that's the that's how uh, the more co more complex image compression all work. Where if you compress an image, you can never get back what you compressed, but you get something which is which is good enough, right? And and if you can if you if you are willing to deal with that, then you get better compression, and that's that's the basis for JPEG and MPEG and all those things as we see. But this, in the simple case, GIF is lossless, right? Meaning if you take a GIF image and you compress it and then you decompress it, you exactly get back what you stored, right? It's an 8-bit image format, which means that each image pixel is only 8-bit, right? So even though it's it's lossless, it's not entirely true that it's lossless, right? What do I mean by that? Yeah? Um, your original image is probably not in a form that will, you know, you have to lose some information to get it down to an 8-bit thing. Yeah, exactly. So if you had a, if you had this image, right? If you had this image, and if it, if you assume that the the original was in uh, was in true color, which is 24-bit color, right? So when you do when you have to convert to J, uh, to GIF, you have to make it into 8-bit format. In which case, you have to first do some kind of a transformation to make it into 8-bit. So in that, you lose information which you can never get back, right? So that information is lost. But once Beyond that step, whatever you stored would would be the same as what you get back, right? So within GIF, you can you can use custom um, these tables, or you can use standard tables, standard tables that are defined by the standard, or you can define something per image uh, format, right? It uses a LGW compression, which is which is quite popular in, in data compression and, and, and stuff like that. So. At this point, it does not use anything about human vision and all those things. It essentially, it's you can think of this as a, a zip for images. Right? It takes an 8-bit image, it does some sort of a compression, and it's it's lossless, so you get back everything that you you stored. Right? So that's that's GIF. But the, since it doesn't use any of the human eye kind of artifacts, it's not really good to store, say, for this kind of images. Right? One, you lose all the color information because it only stores 8-bit um, rather than 24-bit, and it doesn't use any of the any of the notion about I, I, I vision and all those things. So it's not really that good, right? What it's good for is some of the things that uh, things we'll see later on is not good for, right? The the images like J, JPEG and all are designed as we'll see in the next slide, for photographs. JPEG is a, is a sign for photographs, so it expects things that are in photographs to be well compressed. So this is a photograph, that means it has lots of variation itself, so it's designed for storing this kind of image where if you store it using J, uh, uh, JPEG, you shouldn't see these blotches, right? But as you will, the, the corollary of that is, it's not really good for pictures which are not photographs, right? For example, think of a cartoon, right? Think of a cartoon, or think of a, um, uh, like a bitmap cartoon, or, or, or few color cartoons, right? And they tend not to be as good for storing in in, in, GIF, in JPEG 
because all the things we, we kind of expect is not true, right? So one of the one of the thing is if you, most of the cartoons, most of the cartoons you can you, you see in newspapers and stuff, they tend to be human drawn, hand drawn. They don't tend to have lots of colors, right? They, they tend to have few colors, if at all, like black and white kind of stuff. So they don't really need a 24-bit color, even if you if you could give it to them. So they don't really they cannot really use the JPEG the JPEGs full thing. We will we'll see. And since they're generated by human beings, you have lines and you have text and all those things, which are not really as good for JPEG, right? I'm not saying that GIF is very good for dealing with text. It's just that GIF does not really care what you have. It, 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 it's a compression algorithm using regular old compression. So it doesn't really care what kind of things you store, right? Except the things that we, we, we use, we, um, we use in JPEG does not quite apply. So if, if, you're, if you're thinking about storing, um, so even in, in the web right now, if you think of like small images, small icons and stuff, especially cartoons and stuff, GIF is still the way to go. But for most other purposes, GIF is not, 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 not the way to go. So most of the, I've never seen a camera which, is, which stores images in GIF because it's just awful format for storing photographs, right? Where did I put that? It's on the desk right there. Oh, sorry, thanks. So mod modern images that, that we, we all use are stored in, in JPEG, right? So JPEG is, is a 24-bit format, which means that it can store in true color all, all the images that you want. And most of us operate in JPEG. For, I mean, most of the web images are in JPEG and all, all those things, right? So JPEG, so it, since it's 20, 24 bit, since it has three times as much image as you have in a GIF image, it has to do something, otherwise the images will tend to be pretty big. So one of the things it does is it's a lossy transformation. Meaning even if you have 24 bit color, once you do the transformation, once you compress it, when you uncompress it, you don't exactly get what you stored, you lose information, right? And the way it loses information, you cannot retrieve them by doing some pre-processing, uh, post-processing, so you, it's completely lost, right? So it has a number of steps, and, and so essentially what, what one of the things it does is, it, remember I, I said at some point that eyes are not good to, uh, the human eye is not good to see high frequency. High frequency is lots of small details, right? So we are better at seeing like a, a shade rather than seeing minor details, unless you really focus on it. So in the, in the previous case of like looking at the scenery, you are, you are better at seeing the, 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 the bigger detail, but not the, the small things like the blades, or the, the grass blades and all those things, unless you are willing to go up front and you know, use some, micro, um, some way to expand and look at, zoom in and look at the images, right? So most part you can't see this stuff. So I need to drop those details the way to do the details is if I convert them from spatial domain, which is the 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 you know um, the space is like you know the x and y coordinate domain. If I convert that into a frequency domain using a, a fast Fourier trans, uh, transformation, then the the details are the high frequency components. So essentially, if I can take your um, the spatial co coordinates, transform them into frequency domain. Fast Fourier, which you, if you are in uh, W, you use a lot of it. Um, and so essentially, then you can drop these components at the frequency domain. And then you can, so then if you do the reverse, uh, reverse of this process, then you can get what you want, right? So that's the basic idea of what you want to do. Uh, so you want to do the, the transformation, you want to do the fast Fourier, and if you uh, are from W, if you know the algorithm, it tends to be pretty compute intensive, so you, you want to avoid doing high preci precision fast Fourier transformation because it, you know, it takes a lot more compute resources, which are not available when the standard was developed. So one of the ways they do, they deal with that is through using a, a discrete, cos discrete cosine transformation, which approximates the fast, for, uh, fast Fourier and it operates on integers, right? So this is this is a fully integer-based operation. So the nice things over here for implementation purposes is we can do this fast Fourier transformation, which which t technically is a um, uses real numbers and stuff. But since uh, these are images, since they're going to be displayed as 24-bit uh, integers anyway. Right, we, we can use integer-based operations. So when you do the uh, JPEG compression, that particular step, right, it's 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 compute intensive, but it's all integer-based. So that's that's good for us to implement, especially from the hardware perspective, right? We don't want to have too many um, real numbers. 
So once you do this transformation, it's in the frequency domain. So, and then you can decide to choose, drop the higher frequency components, right? What that means is, let's take an image in spatial format, which is like, you know, we have a zero to hex and, um, in, you know, so you have some, uh, some, some chunk of image in spatial component, right? You do the transformation. In frequency domain, it becomes a equation, right? So something like um, x bar n plus, and, and so on and so forth, right? And the way you do the discrete transformation, you still can retain this to be the same, right? Which essentially means that you, you drop off the super high frequency components because you want to retain it to the same size because that makes compression and dealing with operations uh, objects easier, right? So you don't want to deal with, so you don't want to change the object size because as, as programmers, you know that it's good to know what the size of the output matrix should be. So when you do this discrete cosine transformation, I go from the same zero, the, the same size of the matrix, except now it's in frequency domain, which represents what I have to write here. And the way discrete cosine transformation works, it essentially, you have to do it in a this zigzag fashion, right? So, so this equation, the, 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 the coordinates are in a zigzag fashion, right? To drop the high frequency components, I can operate on this matrix and essentially drop the higher frequency components, right? So I, essentially, I can multiply something with this stuff to make it go away, right? So one way to multiply something to go away would be to multiply some things with zero, right? So if I create another matrix, right? And if I put all these values to be zero, right? So essentially, when I, up, when I multiply these two matrices, right, I, all these values go away, right? Which means that all those frequency components get dropped, right? So this is called the quantization table, which is essentially what creates the, the, the sets of stuff, right? If, if all these values happen to be one, right, then you essentially get the same image, so you get the same quality image. So if you, if you use a quantization matrix of one, then you get the exact same image that you sent. So this sort of degenerates to sort of like a GIF-ish kind of notion, even though it's not true because the discrete cosine transformation is sort of lossy, right? If you have it all zero, then you essentially get a black image. So the key is to find this quantization table which will give you good results, right? So the, the, the reason why JPEG works is this table, right? So get, generating this table is, is the hard part, and different algorithms use different numbers, and those are backed up by doing a lot of user studies to see if you use different numbers, what the values would be, right? So if you look at uh, a particular, so if you look at the public domain JPEG um, compression table, they use one standard image, right? Which gives good quality for the most part. So if you use, like for example, Photoshop to compress your images, Photoshop uses his own quality metrics, which is proprietary, they're not gonna release it to you. And the, the, uh, if you make this stuff really good, then you will lose the components which are least visible to you. And of course, one of the annoying parts about all, all kind of image and media and all those things are, when companies do this stuff, it's all patented, so you have no, no it's copyright, copyrighted, so you have no idea what they actually have, right? Um, so you will not, you, one of the annoying parts with this stuff is, we cannot implement this stuff, you cannot even study these things because it's all, uh, all copyrighted, right? But the standard allows you to choose whatever table you want. There's no magic in this stuff. It essentially helps you drop the components you want. So once you do this operation, once you drop these components, now you have the, this table left over. You unwind this stuff, unwind the string, the, the, the using the zigzag fraction, which is defined by the uh, discrete cosine transformation. Then you can use Huffman coding, right? Um, Huffman coding, if you remember, um, from, from an algorithms class, essentially you try to find out, you try to give the smallest amount of bits for the longest sequence of num, uh, uh, con, con, contents, right? So, so if you have, if you're storing some word which is, right? If you see lo longest sequence, longest and most popular sequence, you want to give it the smallest one. So you, you may transform that to one, and 
the shorter sequence, not so, so frequent, you would, you would want to use longer bits, right? So it's a, it's a lossless compression, right? So you don't have to know the details of how it does, but any lossless compression would work, right? The, the key challenge is any lossless compression works well when it has a lot of redundancy, right? Any comp the, the, the reason why compression algorithm works is you have a lot of redundancy. So if you have a lot of redundancy, then you get better compression, right? For practical purposes, we cannot do this for the whole image because you need to create a quantization matrix for every image, every uh, matrix, right? So we cannot have one matrix for the whole image because then if you had a 640 by 480 image, you need to have one quantization table. If you have 641 by 480, you need to have another quantization table because it depends on the quantization table, right? So it's not practical. So what they do is they split the image into eight by eight blocks. Right. So your JPEG image, you take the JPEG image, split them into a constant size blocks. Eight by eight is considered to be good enough that, you know, it's big enough that you, you get enough uh, uh, high frequency components, but small enough that you can process, right? So this is standard size developed in 90s and stuff. So even on your camera or your cell phone, you have enough computation power to operate on eight by eight uh, data rather than a large, large size. Also, so the only problem comes in if you have an image which has, uh, which is which is not in the eight by eight boundary, um, and you have to add uh, blacks to the end to, I mean, uh, zeros to the other values to do this operation, right? So essentially, you take the image, right, split them into eight by eight blocks, perform this operation, do this quantization, get the string, right, and then you run the Huffman, and you're looking for similarity. You're looking for the same kind of stuff, right? What this means is. Suppose in your real real image, right? Suppose you have some you have something here, something in this image, something in this image, something in this image. These are all eight by eight, right? You do this transformation, you get the low frequency components, right? You drop them off, right? And then you you straighten them up in a certain fashion, right? In the exact fashion. To get better compression, you need to find a lot of redundancy, right? So intuitively, you get a lot of redundancy if, say, all of them are the same, right? If if this happens to be this, if this happens to be all ones, right? After the this operation, this happens to be all one, all one, all one, right? So you tend to get larger things, right? So anytime you have lots of these blocks which all look the same, right? You tend to have good compression because your traditional compression algorithm, like Huffman coding, is looking for lots of the same thing. So when you have lots of smooth stuff, you get good compression because they, they all tend to go to the right way, to get a good compression, right? But suppose you had lots of variation, right? Like, you know, suppose this, uh, this is some, if you look at them as an as a image, there's lots of detail here, there's a lot of detail here, there's a lot of detail here, there's a lot of detail here. So even if you drop the high frequency components, if they tend to be different from here to here to here, right? Then your Huffman encoding cannot do much, right? So in that case, if you aggressively drop more quality components, so if you aggressively make this, this, this quality thing more and more, eventually you can drop enough information, right? So the trivial case is if I have a quality matrix of zero, all zeros, then any image can be compressed very good because essentially that means um, if it's all zeros and all of them will become go to zero, all of them is going to zero, so I can represent the whole image in one bit, right? I can, I can just say the whole image is black, right? You don't want to go all that way, but that's that's the key, right? So how much you can compress a JPEG image depends on what. So can you tell exactly how much a JPEG image would look like? How much storage it would take for you? The reason is, the answer is you cannot, right? The answer is cannot because it depends on, on how these images are set up. So I have to, so what would I need? So if I give you two images, right? And I ask you which one would compress better than the other one, right? How would you know what to, how to answer that stuff?
I'll put it the other way, right? I have an image. I, I, so what do you expect would happen for um, a cartoon? A cartoon, I, I mean, I, I have like some kind of a letter written like this, right? So what happens is this around this, right, next to it, there, there are a lot of detail, right? There's a lot of detail because this essentially, in, when you're looking at it from a pixel perspective, you see this little jagged kind of stuff. So you have lots of detail, right? So a lot of high frequency components, right? So it's not really good for that because what happens is if you leave all the high frequency components, right, so you can actually see what is written, right, then your Huffman coding won't work very well because now you have lots of components here, lots of components here, lots of components here, all those things. So these strings will look completely different, right? If I aggressively compress and lose all the detail, then I get good compression, but I won't be able to read the, read the stuff, right? So, so, so think about how, how these things will, will react, but essentially if you look at a JPEG image, uh, JPEG is really awful for writing text on it. If you have small text on it and if you use JPEG, because of the way it works, you don't get anything, any saving at all. You either get no savings at all, or if you want a lot of saving, you have to aggressively drop all the details. So aggressively drop all the details that you see, so essentially you can't read it, right? So you can either read it or you don't get good savings. But for, for pictures and stuff, especially natural scenes, right? Natural events don't tend to be as, um, as detailed, especially at, at the distance that you're taking with a normal camera and stuff. So you get good compression. So JPEG can get really good uh, compression for uh, images like that. So in fact, you can get better compression um, with JPEG than uh, with GIF, right? So, it, so it, it is a case that for, for photographs, if you take the image, convert them into GIF, and then if you store them, the GIF image will be larger than the same image taken using JPEG, and you still use high, high enough quality that it's still visibly good that you get the best, best component, right? To, to um, JPEG also goes one step further, right? Because it knows that you, we can't see the, we can see the brightness better than the, the color level. So it, it, it transforms the RGB into YCB and CR. So essentially all this, all the operation we talked about, it'll do it in, yeah, you know, Y, C, B, and C, R. So you, instead of having a red, red matrix, green matrix, and blue matrix, you do the transformation to Y, C, B, and C, R, and we operate on the, the y, y matrix separately, C, B matrix separately, and C, R matrix separately. And then it, it does a subsampling on them on 4, 2, 0. We'll see what that is in, in a few slides. But essentially what that means is, Suppose you had an image which is 4x times 4x, right? Just, just to make life easier. That means in, in RGB terms, the R would be 4x times um, 4x times 4x, right? G would be 4x times 4x, uh, be 4x, 4, 4x times 4x. What we are, the subsampling means is you essentially create your Y image, which is 4x times 4x, right? CB, which will be x, x X, uh, x by x, and CR, which is x by x, right? And then we'll, we'll see how exactly it does, what this uh, two, you know, two and zero means in, in, a, in a few slides. But the uh, idea here is it only has one fourth of the information that is in the luminance level. So when you take a picture, I take the, the luminance aspect of it, and it's stored in the full dimensions that you talked about. For the color, for color components, it only has one fourth of it, which when you look at it as data, it's only one fourth. Or the way to think about it is you take four, four pixels, right? You replace them with one single value. So all the four will have the same value, right? That, that's one way of looking at uh, one fourth uh, scaling, right? So when you, when you have one fourth scaled image, if you want to bring it back to the original size, you just take each pixel, create a four by four pixel of the same value. So essentially that's what, what you do, right? So you get compression using the fact that you lose the high quality components, and you also get more compression because rather than keeping the three times R, G, and B, you only keep, so you only keep 1.5 times as much data, right? No, not 1.5, 1. 1. right, 1.5, right? Rather than three, I only keep 1.5, right? So, 
so th so both these through both these ways, I get really good uh, good good compression for JPEG. And the reverse transformation is the same. Reverse transformation is, is sort of trivial because once you know the the the, the quality matrix, I reapply it and and get back to the original scene, right? The other aspects which are not uh, very relevant to what we're trying to do is every time you compress and uncompress a JPEG image, every time you operate on it, you lose data, right? So even if you don't change the quality matrix, the the, the discrete cosine and everything, you still lose uh, data. So the more you operate on a JPEG image, the, the worse it becomes, right? So JPEG is not an image where you're supposed to operate on it a lot, lot, lot many times. You should leave it as it is, right? Um, I'm not sure how much the, the consumers know the stuff. And, and every time you operate on it, you lose, you don't gain any, any more information, right? You lose information, so you're losing the, the quality. And you also may increase in size depending on what, what quantization table you use and, and how these things work out. It's very hard to exactly predict how, how much size you, you would get in the output unless you analyze the whole image, right? And that's one of the reasons when you, when you have digital cameras, they don't exactly tell you how many pictures you can take. It sort of says you can take 10 more pictures and then you find that some pictures uh, you, you, you get to store more and some other pictures you get tend to uh, take less, less stuff, right? So if you're taking a picture of, of the beach or if you're taking the picture of the sand in the beach or if you're taking a picture of the sky, you know, so let's say blue skies, right? Which one do you think would compress better? If, if I'm compressing this in a in JPEG in your camera, right? Wants to the sky. the sky, right? So if you take a sky then you'll find that your camera estimation would say you can take some more pictures. And if you take like something like uh, sand and stuff, it's, it's gonna compress more. So your numbers will go from, you know, you can, you can take 10 more pictures to say eight more pictures because of what, what it thinks it happened, right? Um, and I, I, I apologize, and this monitor is really awful, right? Because um, I think the, the, the projector we have is a base resolution of 800 by 600, right? So when you project anything beyond that, it's it's doing interpolation to actually see what, what happens. Um, but but hopefully you, you get some sense, right? So if I take this image, this this happens to be some castle, right? This original image, I want to compress it using JPEG. I, I got this from Wikipedia. So this is a good way to see it because other way to see it, you can't see it, right? So the, the annoying part is, even if I compress it quite aggressively to basically make it really blocky, in this particular screen, it'll look fairly good because of the display is really bad, right? So what happens when you, when you aggressively compress is you create what is called JPEG artifacts, which means that the high frequency component goes away and you see blocky stuff, right? So what happens is if I compress really aggressively, you would not do notice any difference here, right? Because the, this, this is smooth enough, there are very few high, uh, high frequency components here. So it'll look the same as however much you compress, right? When you get to something like here, this is a lot of detail, right? And remember, you have, it, it only operates on eight by eight uh, pixels, so it, it's not clear where it happens. So, and for example, like the, this tree kind of stuff, right? It's losing the high frequency components. What that means is if you, if you can see over here, this is fall foliage, right? I mean, it looks like there's like some orange and green leaves, right? So if in the original, it happens to have like leaves, like, like eight by eight pixel, let's say, this is the detail, right? So when you go to lower frequency components, it loses this distinction, right? So rather than having this, it becomes sort of, um, this all sort of becomes like one color kind of stuff, right? And that's the JPEG effect. You, you would have seen this, like a sort of a blocky thing. You would have seen this in TV more than uh, you see it on images, right? So if you have digital cable or, or satellite or whatever, when the signal is weak, you tend to see this kind of a blocky way, right? Um, if you remember from old days when you have analog TV, when, um, how many of you remember analog TV, right? I guess, I guess in a few days it's gonna go away. What happens in analog TV when you have lots of uh, noise? How does the picture, Degrade. Yeah. It just gets grainy. Sometimes the colors go bad. 
Yeah, you get a lot of grains, right? You get a lot of grains and you, you, color goes, goes away because it doesn't have enough color information because it, it's using the same scaling, so it's losing color, right? But it gets grainy, right? But as in, in, in this form, if you don't get enough information, you will lose the stuff, so you will notice that the whatever happens would happen in square kind of stuff, right? If you, if you go back and look at your TV and you lose signal, it doesn't become like a, like a circle green kind of thing. You lose information, and the last information will, look, will show up as a square, right? So what may happen is this square will all be gray or all be blue or something, but you see this little square because that's the basic block. We'll see what, what that means for when you go to um, um, video and stuff. So essentially what happens is you expect a lot more things to go bad here than over here. But the nice thing is you would notice a lot more things going off here far faster than what you can see here, right? Unless you're really interested, unless it so happens that you are standing right here in this picture and you want to see who you are, right? And you can't see it anyway because it's so small you probably don't want to see it. The image will still look good, right? So they did a, um, so what they did was they took a quality factor of 50, right? Which which, um, which is a number, usually the JPEG, they describe it as a quality factor of zero to 100, right? And they have to do lots of human trials to make sure that 50 sort of corresponds to 50% of the original image quality, right? Uh, and, 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 and the reason how they came up with the matrix is beyond the scope of this class because it, it's proprietary to most companies. So what this shows is he take, took the image, did a quality factor 50 compression, and then you look at the output. And then you did a difference between those two images, the original and the difference. And then you make the magnitude of the difference show up as darkness, right? So what this means is that the difference, there's more difference here than here. If the difference is very minimal, it shows up as, if there's no difference, it shows up as white. If it's completely different, it looks as black. So this is how the, the difference would have happened, right? The, when you did the, so I, I can't show it to you on the screen because in the, in the screen it'll look the same to you, right? But in terms of actual data, what happened was you would lose a lot more data on the high frequency components, which is essentially all the details. And on the things that may have no detail, you, yeah, um, there's, there's not much difference, but you get good compression there because, you know. Um, so, so that's, that's the, the notion of JPEG. And we'll get back to that again in terms of, we, we use that to the next level when you, when you talk about video compression like MPEG-2 and MPEG-4 and all those things. But the magic happens here in terms of the discrete cosine transform is fairly trivial, but the quantization table is, is it. I mean, the, 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 the goodness of the quantization table defines, uh, defines how much you get, get, get a compression, right? So you use this different things for, um, for different uh, uh, algorithms. So when you talk about a, a JPEG, JPEG image, right? Technically, it should be a JFIF image, right? Uh, JFIF is the file format. So JPEG is the compression the algorithm, right? So you don't store a JPEG file; you store the JPEG compressed image inside a file with its own headers and stuff. So technically, it's a JPEG JFIF, right? It's a JPEG compression inside a, a JPEG file format, interchange format. Right? So you can store it, the, another file interchange format is TIFF. Many of you may have heard of this TIFF, TIFF format. So TIFF is usually considered to be lossless, right? But TIFF can store a JPEG image, right? So you can compress an image using JPEG and store it inside a TIFF, right? Which sort of looks confusing, but, but the idea here is JPEG is a compression algorithm and the, the file format that you talk about in terms of um, uh, GIF or, or what, what have you um, is is JFIF, right? Um, and there are there are other other images that you probably use, and this PNG, which is a lossy and a lossy uh, lossless comp components. And PostScript is a different kind of uh, beast, right? PostScript is a is a vector vector based language, which what that means is it is not storing the image as an image as a as a bitmap image. It's storing it as an algorithm, right? So it's saying that. I, I have to plot some, let's say, a circle here. So PostScript does not, it's not actually showing it as a bitmap, but it's actually rendering it, rendering the document. So in, in terms of if you have characters and stuff, PostScript is really good because your, your PostScript interpreter is actually running the algorithm to draw the line, right? So you may say, I have a circle which is like this, this particular stuff. So you're generating the circle. There's no loss here. Um, so 
PDF uses you know PostScript inside, and PostScript also lets you store bitmap in the in the worst case. So PostScript is not a good format to store, for example, images because it's not optimized for that. It's optimized for storing text and stuff because it's essentially drawing this, drawing the redrawing the stuff, right? So I'm, I'm going to stop at, 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 at this at this uh, section. But what you have to remember is, like, many of us use JPEG for cameras. Most of the cameras that you buy these days use uh, JPEG to store images. So now you understand what what happens. You have to ask yourself what that means for whatever you're doing, right? JPEG is really good to take pictures of photographs and then printing it or seeing it on screen. JPEG was not designed for taking, you know. Uh, um, cartoons or text or medical images or some other other things, right? Um, because if you do, then you see the artifacts of, of, of all the limitations of, of JPEG, um, and you know we'll 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 continue with this on the next lecture.